Could everyone turn their mics off, please? Hi everyone, a very big welcome from the Tannehill Arts Festival. We are absolutely thrilled uh, that Script to Stage is part of our festival this year. I want to say a huge thanks to Jacqueline and to Karen and Script to Stage for being here. We cannot wait until COVID times are such that we can do this face to face, but I think uh, we're very, very excited to be able to do this online today. Welcome. Tannehill Arts Festival was the brainchild of one Alan Fleming Baird. He's often in the background, uh, but I want to acknowledge him as, as the person who started the festival. There was a feeling that given the amazing talent that is from this area, and there's so much creative talent in this area that it deserved a platform, and we want to use the creative arts to bring people together, uh, especially as we come out of, of COVID-19. I want to thank, um, you'll see, you won't see him today, uh, but Tom and also Hopscotch Theatre, who have been so generous with their time and their resources uh, to facilitate the live stream of Script to Stage. So without further ado, I shall hand it over to Jacqueline and Karen, and thank you so much. Hi there, I am Alison from Script Stage and we have two plays for you today and we will start with the first one, which is Dilemma, directed by Karen Herbison. Hi, we've got Sean Moore playing um, the leading character in this fabulous monologue that was written by Helen Sinclair and directed by myself. Aye. I invite you to picture the scene, ladies and gentlemen. Brian, my high-achieving, illustrious sex brother-in-law, scurrying out through the front door of a lower-budget hotel with the demeanour of a scared rat, trying to look anything but desperate as he emerges with a street life outside. It's so fucking unfair, he'll be thinking. Why me? I didn't have anything to do with this. Oh boy, is he deluding himself. Something our Brian is very good at. The worst part of it, for him, will be imagining the damage to his precious reputation once it all comes out. Oh my God, am I enjoying this. You really couldn't make it up. It's understandable. The girl's death shocked him to the core and I sympathise. Well, to some extent, at least. I mean, to say, it's just sod's law, isn't it? You're Donald Duck, tough shit at the end of the day. If fate decides that you're to be the unlucky client with her when she suddenly hits an expiry date like that. That she was a personal services professional was hardly relevant in this grand scheme of things. But Brian knew instinctively that this would be what would get all those tongues wagging. Especially his exes, my dear twin Joanna. Already well practiced at playing the martyred spouse, she'd undoubtedly be at the head of the stone casting queue as detractor in chief. Saddest of all is the irony of his having known so little about the girl. Karina. 
the only name she'd ever gone by. Bound to be fake anyway. A stage name, as it were. As to where she lived, or with whom, who knows? We'll all find out soon enough, I suppose. The bottom line, apart from her name, Brian knew only two things about her with any certainty. Namely, her mobile number, and, dare I say it, her unrivaled talent in the bedroom. What? Just keep listening. It's a fair bet you're not as shocked yet as you're going to be. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but it is by way of providing additional, nay, essential backstory to this story tale. I must stress that what I am about to divulge is privileged information. A confession, in fact. A scenario of which even Brian had no knowledge. I would therefore appreciate it if you'd kindly keep it to yourselves. So, I'm not about to make any excuses for what I did. You can and no doubt will judge my behaviour for yourselves. All I'm doing is relating facts. Every opportunity lately, Brian the bold Casanova has been regaling me with an intolerable amount of Karina hyperbole. In the end, sheer curiosity drove me to, uh, to sample her delights for myself. Dip my own wick, you might say. But you weren't expecting that. Well, I'm only human, you know. I'm currently single, so what's the harm? I'd love to lay it on thick to Brian Boy about um, how superior an experience Karina had with me, but now's probably not the best time. I'll hold that particular revelation for another day. For now, suffice to say that lovely young girl has connection, had a body so outrageously well constructed it was simply made for sex, this silky smooth skin all over, a luscious size 32 double Bs with a life all her own, wild mop of curly red hair, all natural. Yeah, you've got the picture. Seductive green cat's eyes and a long, long tongue. Brian's told me ad nauseam about his gratitude to the gods for their beneficence in having Karina lap dance her way into his life. In the beginning, he'd tried convincing himself, with no one else, that she was little more to him than a useful research material for a character in a future novel. But in no time, he was completely addicted. Who can blame him, really? I mean to say. And now, he'll have to get his story straight and pronto. Figure out what he's going to do. But what exactly had happened in there? See, I only have his very stilted version of things to go on. Believe me, despite my usual practice, this is one voicemail message that I will not be wiping anytime soon. Word for word, this is the message I received from him. Andy, are you there? Pick up, pick up, please. Bro, oh man, man, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. I, I can't leave a message. I, I need your help. It's, it's too far gone. I need to talk to you in person. Please, please call me back. ASAP, will you? It's really urgent. Life and death, bro. Life and death. I don't mind admitting my curiosity was piqued. Though coming from the man we all know so well, it was tempting to write off as just another one of his tiresome melodramas. However, when I listened to his message a second time, I realised there was genuine hysteria in his voice. So, against my better judgement, I returned his call, making sure to press the record button answered the first ring. He sounded in a dreadful state. Ever since our school days together at Glasgow High, when we were perennial debating society rivals, Brian has considered himself to have an exceptional mastery of the English language. In truth, I can't disagree. It's a very useful attribute in a writer. 
Well, on that call, entirely at odds with his familiar brand of smug, forceful delivery, it was an incredibly confused pile of jumbled up shite. One irrefutably positive thing I can say about Brian, he is not, nor has ever been, capable of lying. Not a fantasist for sure, but never a liar. Ergo, I decided it would be wise to transcribe the whole of our conversation verbatim, whereby an orderly sequence of events could be assembled. For the record. So, it's for you to decide what's to be made of this. Earlier in that evening, he'd finished off a tricky chapter in his latest book. He'd rewarded himself with a large, chilled shabbly. He then rung Joanna's and chatted briefly with the boys. This was a nightly ritual that was becoming more and more strained for my nephews every bit as much as for my father. Parenting duty out of the way, his thoughts turned in a far more self-indulgent, carnal direction. He speed-dialed Karina. An hour later, hard lacquered nails were tapping in the door of Brian's rent by the hour hotel room, and she came without waiting to be invited. Eyes never leaving her client, Karina had slowly peeled off her long black fur coat to reveal that the only thing she was wearing was a Bordeaux red lipstick and the way of starter, she was flicking a leather cat and ring tails in his direction. Brian went on to provide a trough of salacious detail. I see nothing to be gained by reporting the minute eye of what transpired next. Suffice to say, the next hour had gone pretty much according to a familiar script. I'm confident smart folk like you can imagine this well enough for yourselves. Until events took an entirely unforeseen turn. Brian had no idea how to put a name to what actually happened in there. He'd never experienced anything like it. Some kind of a fit, perhaps? Could be. Fatal heart defect? Possibly. Or had she been drugged? Poisoned, even? God forbid. He simply couldn't get his head round it. What he did know, though, it was a hellish spectacle that had scared the living daylights out of Karina's lovely young face suddenly distorted beyond recognition, strange animal sounds escaping from that sweet little mouth that had become horribly contorted, drooling blood, her body jerking out of control, all this for a shockingly long time. It felt like him to forever. Brian recalled screaming at her at one point to stop pissing about. He should have called 999. Of course he should but he was utterly incapable of thinking straight at the time, let alone acting responsibly. Karina finally lay still and Brian's heart rate momentarily recovered, but only until it dawned on him what a hell of a predicament he was in. The cold hard truth of the matter was that he had stood by helplessly watching the death throes of a sex worker. For God's sake, and even though it was through no fault of his own, he couldn't help wondering what part of our Congress, yeah, that's the word he actually used, might have played in it. So, guided by an all too human instinct for self preservation, our bold hero had quickly gathered up his things and ignominiously scarpered. And that's where I came in. Without a doubt, it's the most intriguing call I have ever received. And as a defence lawyer, believe me, I've been more than my fair share of weird ones. The question is, what in the name of God am I going to do that out of? Thank you, Sean. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, 
what we have now is a bit of a Q&A session. If anybody would like to ask questions or uh, have a chat about, you know, what we did, I think probably Karen, um, it would be good to start with you or possibly even with um, Helen, see what she wants to say or. Yeah. Hi there. Oh, Sean, I don't think you should put yours on mute. I think people might want to talk to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm thrilled to bits with that performance, Sean. I told you yesterday or the day before, I could not have imagined a better Andy. <laughs> you did that so wonderfully well. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, for giving me a chance to play with it. I no, loved what you did fun, at the end fun. there too. <laughs> when you see, you see um, a standalone thing, um, you don't know any background, any descriptors, um, so that you've got so much to play with. You can you can yeah. just make mold this whole person depending on your reaction to the, the the lines that you wrote, the, the 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 little bit of information that you gave us, and I think that's that's the beauty of it. People yeah. interpret it so many different ways. So yeah, lots of artistic license for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, Helen, what made a seemingly respectable lady um, write such a piece? Well, very good question. Um, this actually started, this story started many years ago, I think up to about 12 years ago when I first started doing creative writing classes. And I, the instruction was to come right out your comfort zone and write a, a prose piece for 1600 words or something like that. So it began, that's how it began life. And over the years I've altered it, I've jumped back to it for different reasons. And in a recent creative writing class with uh, Linda Jackson, my, my illustrious writing teacher, um, she asked us to create a peripheral narrative piece. So I thought, oh, I know, I'll bring that one out of the cupboard and see what I can do with that. So it was an easy jump from peripheral narrator piece to monologue, but they're almost the same as far as I can tell. Maybe Linda can correct me on that. So that's the background. I had to do a lot of imagining, may I insist? <laughs> <laughs> but I had fun with it, real fun. Yeah. Karen, how was it for you directing a piece like that? Well, you know, it's one of those ones, it, it was, obviously it's always great to get into a rehearsal room, so that would have been lovely, um, because I think uh, I, I, a lot of this is on body language and, and the actor's response to it, and I think as a director, you're there as a guide, I think, particularly in a piece like this, because you've got to allow the actor to lend so much of themselves, or how they see it, just like what Sean's saying, giving them that rope you know to go with um in the absence of that we um i just i basically sent sean the script with i get it was almost like when you're reading it have a think about this and consider that and so it was kind of phone loaded um and i think in a piece like that that's probably how i would have worked i would have worked in building the character um and then let the actor go with it with guidance so that's kind of what we did. Um, but Sean, I think in that first rehearsal we had, that one hour, and it was one hour, um, you know, he brought so much to it already. There was there was little guidance needed, it has to be said. I think um, what was a, a learning curve for, for me as well was, it was words, so I was given words. Helen wrote some words, and, and, and I'm used to doing words at a microphone. Uh, and 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 or writing words to 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 to, to bring out emotions in people, and I kind of forgotten about the, the the body language thing until Karen said, and I reminded, oh yeah, I'm acting. I'm not just reading, acting, right? And it was <laughs> like you've got all these other bits to use and and, and things. <laughs> so it was that 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 was an interesting kind of oh, you've got other things to and and Karen gave me little pointers um, about. about uh, doing other things apart from just the expressive um, the words so that, 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 was, that was good fun No it was it was really nicely done it was really enjoyable um, and having having read it just um, flat on the page the 
you've lifted it beautifully. It's it's yeah. really given it. It's absolutely really nice. A really nice example of um, collaboration, even although it's one person on the screen. Um, mm. The the collaboration between the writers piece and then the the performance has is oh really nicely done, really good. Yeah. Well done, Sean. Well done, Karen and Helen. Yeah, thank you. It was a joy. <laughs> It was it was wonderful yeah great experience yeah is there any questions from audience or that's what yes I can i ask um uh, karen i uh, i loved i remember before we started today and i said to sean where's your tie and um jokingly and then the tie came in and that was so beautifully done and, and a great piece i don't know whose idea it was um between the two of you but I thought it was a great one <laughs> <laughs> uh, so nice and, and you were so relaxed Sean it was just yeah, so yeah. natural and then the punchline at the end just finished yeah. it off I'm, I'm actually the defence lawyer <laughs> and the, the idea for that was it, it came from me watching Sean and the way he was um, mm -hmm. just the way he was delivering and acting and I just you know that way I just thought oh <clears throat> it's almost like he should be doing something and this is kind of you know, off the top of his head, but I'm busy doing something else. So it's really not that big a deal. Um, and that's where it came from. But it, I was prompted to think about that by the way he was delivering, it has to say. And I think, like you say, Alison, that's the example of collaboration. You know, you're not going in and as a director and saying, right, this is what I want. You know, you're looking at what you're being given and, and working it together, shaping it together. Yeah, definitely. Could I say too that for the first time we invited um, people to send in ideas and, and synopsis and, and uh, half finished scripts almost as it were. And Helen, the first thing Helen presented was very similar to this, but we had a meeting, the, I think it was four of us plus Helen. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we discussed it in some detail and Helen went away and worked on it and come back with this new script. And I just, uh, it just worked really well. I was really pleased with it. Mm -hmm. It's a good example of how, again, how collaboration yeah. works in writing. Yeah, very true. yeah, I feel like the very, very lucky person in all of this in that I've had all this, the benefit of all this wonderful experience and advice. And I'm going to take it away with me and, and keep working on scripts because I'm, I'm finding that I'm really loving doing this. It's a new adventure for me um, as of this year, really, but I'm loving it. So <laughs> watch this, please. <laughs> that's, the, that's the original point of it all. It's Hi. all about, um, you know, trying to help writers and particularly writers for stage, because as we all know, the words on the page are only a part of it. You have to hear it and see Hi. it to, to be able to, to see where it's actually going. And, um, and yeah, that went. <laughs> and if I, I feel too that if I hadn't had if, if the script hadn't had Sean presenting it it might have been a different matter I just take my hat all my hats off to you Sean <laughs> <laughs> from now on you're going to be Andy in my mind I hope you realise <laughs> that <laughs> which, 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 is, which is great because we've still to decide he's a good guy and a bad guy so I, I know I, I like that I like the fact that, that we don't actually know, you know, I mean, we're, we're given a bit of a clue. The fact that he dipped his wick himself suggests that he's maybe not the nicest of people, but having said that, uh, who knows where he could end up. Yeah. So yeah, I would I would like to see how he gets on in his defence of yeah. the... I just, I just felt that, um, and it was one of the sort of preloaded notes that I gave, I just felt it would have been too easy uh, to, to stop off at the sleazy Andy yeah. way. And I said, you know, how about we play with this and we make him a really nice guy, somebody you'd want to sit and have a beer with and it would confuse you a bit because, oh, he's a nice guy. Oh, oh but he's, what's he saying? So, and it, it's a bit more like real life that, you know, let's be honest, it's complicated. Who's nice? Who's no nice? Who's, oh, you know, so that was a very kind of, that was one of the things I felt quite strongly at at the beginning. Let's, let's not play this for the easy the easy sleaze guy is basically a, um, and Sean did carry that off beautifully. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, is that us? Are we all happy? Anything very much, else? thank you. Okay then, thank you very much indeed. Dilemma, cast and workers, writers, directors, everything. Um, next, we will be having, um, oh, 
Stork. <laughs> I can't remember the full title because I just know it as Stork. It's no place for a Stork. That's what it is. <laughs> okay, Jacqueline, if you want to introduce. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Jacqueline Wilde. I directed uh, Kerry Noor's No Place for a Stork. And um, Kerry is a, a, a writer, mostly of comic novels. And uh, she extracted this from one of the novels, one of the scenes, and worked on it. And we've done quite a lot of work in it. Uh, Kerry and I changed quite a few things. We took out a big scene. Um, we reduced some of the cast. And I think we both agree it works, it works really well. Um, so we got the cast together and we've been rehearsing and uh, I hope you enjoy No Place for a Stork. Thank you. I've seen handkerchiefs bigger than this gown. It doesn't cover anything. Oh, there's no dignity in this place. It's like a doll's dress. One size fits all. One size? It doesn't even do up at the back. Well, I wouldn't worry too much. Once it all starts, the last thing on your mind will be what does up at the back. Stephen will be here any minute. Maybe he can do it up. It's just parking. <laughs> parking. <laughs> Stephen used to hate driving. In fact, he'd do anything rather than drive. Even the doctors can't get a space over here. Having a baby changed all that. As soon as I was throwing up, he was out in the car. That car park's a joke. Practicing every day. Fine tuning his reverse parking. He even took tips from my mum. And no one takes tips from my mum. She drives like there's a fire and she's the only fireman. Like she's some kind of swearing James Bond stuntman. <laughs> Her swerves have written off more cars than a rally driver. The only thing keeping her out of prison is that friggin' wheelchair of hers. Which is why George drives. <laughs> He'll be with her now. How he puts up with her. Stephen says it's the kinky sex. As if. When she first noticed me throwing up, you know what she said? One too many. Like I'm pissed all the time. It was weeks before she realised I was pregnant and not just permanently hung over. Then she began with the rich tea biscuits. Well, they do help. That's what she said. Would you like me to call her? Mum! Mum! <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, she'd be as much use as a, as a clay pigeon. She thinks starvation cures an upset stomach. Well, there, there, there is something to be said for having an empty stomach. She thinks a cough gets better with a good run. What's that for? Nothing to worry about. Very standard. Pre clamps there, all that. Pre what? Well, your blood pressure's a bit high. My, my blood pressure. Oh, don't worry, it's an age thing. Age thing? What, what do you mean an age thing? Uh, am I too old for a baby? Is that it? I mean, the doctor said to... Oh, Jesus, what did she say? Where the fuck is Stephen? Look, I wouldn't worry. I've, I've seen me park a good ten minute walk away to get to work. A good ten minutes? What's good about 10 minutes? Sometimes 20, but that was in the daytime. Oh, 
God, this is all going to be over by the time he gets here. Oh, honey, it takes hours, especially at your age. When I found out I was pregnant, I was so happy. I pictured me, babe in arms, whale music in the background, and Stephen, all sensitive, like David Beckham. I hear you're a, a belly dancer. You've been doing that long? Ten years. Ah, oh, well, that explains it. What? Well, you've got hips that expand like a snake's jaw and close like a clam. My fanny has had more viewings than a house auction <laughs> and I'm supposed to enjoy a joke about clams. <laughs> you can swallow a car down there. A car? What? A mini or a camper van? <laughs> Sense of humour. Good. Ah, uh, yes, uh, dilation's coming across nicely. It'll be a while yet. Marvellous, Doctor. Hands of a concert pianist. Snake jaw. What kind of frigging bedside manner is that? Got a thing about cars. Cars? Oh, don't let that put you off. If I were having a baby, he's the one I'd want. His episiotomies are talked about for months. Seamless. Seamless? What am I, a coat? Wait a minute. Does that mean cuts? Stitches? Down there? Well, sort of. But don't panic, he hardly leaves a mark. Hardly ever. He's more of a caesarean kind of guy. Very safe, very neat. Caesarean? But, but I did all the, the yoga and breathing. Hands like a concert pianist. <laughs> so you said. They're talking about Caesarean, Stephen, do something. Oh, honey, you have the best. He's very good. Joking about cars is just his way of lightening the mood. Cars? Are you okay? No. Is she okay? I think it's just to take your mind off things, love. What? A caesarean? No, cars. So, talking about my bits like it's a garage will have me laughing through labour. That's like saying I should hit my head against the wall and I won't feel the pain when they cut my peri fucking ear. Right, let's just leave the perineum out of it, okay? My mother's been going on about my perineum for months. In fact, ever since I told her I was pregnant. She did mention that a few times. She reckons olive oil and rubbing keep me like a virgin. She wouldn't say that. Your mum doesn't believe in virgins. My Stephen hasn't been able to fry anything for weeks. My mother's put him off olive oil for life. And my Stephen needs all the oil. Look how skinny he is. He's got legs like a plucked chicken. Does she need any medication? Medication? That's your answer for everything. Well, it, it might help. The breathing certainly doesn't seem to work. Well, you're not trying to push a camper van through a cat flap, are you? Maybe we should be thinking about some more medication. Oh, look at you. Oh, you're just beautiful. Oh, 
gosh, you're just like your daddy. Nothing is funny when you're having a baby. No one tells you how scared you become, how despite the whole world and its dog being in the room with you, you are on your own. And no matter how many hold your hand, rub your back and tell you, you're doing great. You're scared, petrified that along with the baby, all of your innards are gonna burst out onto the table, the floor and even the walls and you'll never be able to shit on your own again. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, baby girl, she looks like me. When my daughter arrived, Stephen punched the air like a football player. Like he pushed that frigging baby out himself. The doctors were thought just now. Playing cross-stitch with my bits below. Keep still. I'm sure Stephen will appreciate your handiwork next time he's down there. Uh, stitches, oh, they'll, they'll dissolve in a few days. Nothing to worry about. Helpful to know. Cat guy, I think. I'll remember that next time I look at a cat. Ah, sense of humour. You're going to need that in the next few months. Yeah, got all our fingers and toes. Just a few more stitches. And Cheryl. Yeah, she's fine. She said it was as easy as pulling off a sock. Oops. Oh, I think she's wanting a cup of tea. Well done, all. Good job, good job. Um, yes, where to start? Kerry, Kerry, you're the writer, aren't you? Yes. Uh huh. So how how did the how did that feel to watch? Before I ask you about the process, it was it was amazing. It good, really good, was good to see it acted out. Oh, I think they did a fantastic job. <laughs> And is that the first time you've seen words you've written performed? Because we're saying you you write books. Yeah, I mainly write books. Yeah, I write books really. So uh, it was an interesting process making this into this little scene into a to work. Yeah, yeah. On, you know, with actors. Yeah, cool. Uh, Jacqueline, so what? How did you start the process? Where did you start from? I spoke with um, Kerry first. Mm -hmm. And I, I happened to, to know um, Kerry from uh, Work in the Flames, which is a big performance group. And um, so it was really nice to work with, with Kerry. And um, what I found was Kerry, because she's a, a published writer and because she used to be an editor, but it made the process very easy with good chats about changes to make. She was quite happy with the changes I suggested and made. And so it meant we could really tighten the script up for performance. And I think um, then when we got the cast together, uh, it all went very smoothly. I felt everyone read pretty well the first time. And um, I just felt it came together very easily. And we had, I had some notes for people, but nothing major. And everyone seemed to get it. And I think it's quite a funny script. But it's also very poignant. There's that lovely scene where she talks about being alone. When you have a baby, you're alone, and no matter what, anything else. Mm. So I thought it was a really nice script. It was really, it was a joy to, to direct it. Yeah. Good, good, good. Are we, are we having some of the other the cast on just now? Yeah, we are. Where are they? Because I was going to turn to them and see how did Not you think this. No. <laughs> so we've got Philippa. Um... So I just can. Okay. So how did you, Philippa? How did you, and. What did you think of the process? <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the process. Um, I our first rehearsal, I had a sore, <laughs> sore throat from shouting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, 
I, it was funny actually every single time we did it I found different things that were funny um mm-hmm. and then different things that were actually a bit more kind of meaningful a bit sort of more from the heart um and I think there's um I think it's quite good fun flipping from one to the other um because it could have been it could have been played at like 90 miles an hour and quite sort of slapstick uh-huh. um Oh. But I think there's little bits and bobs in there that sort of just yeah. bring it back to reality. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I particularly like the bit where we saw your feet, you know, in the forefront. That was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> there could I have been worse camera views in that one. You know, I'm really glad. Yeah, now bet you did look a bit kind of oh, <laughs> this is your life. <laughs> so what, what about Callum and Scott? Um, have you been have you been doing this kind of process on Zoom for the past eighteen months or? Uh, uh, I've I've, uh, I've been involved in a, a few things that have been uh, happening on Zoom, um, which uh, uh, a few, they they tended to fizzle out after a while just because it was uh, even although everybody was in lockdown <laughs> and um, you know no, nobody had much else to do. Um, suddenly people found a lot of other things and uh, one one project i was involved with ha- half the cast um ended up getting uh, stranded in california oh. so we were trying to rehearse with them but the uh, uh, yeah well well exactly and the uh, the the delay as well mm-hmm. um i mean we've got a little bit of delay kind of going between glasgow and paisley here um but uh, between uh, on that on that we were between cardiff and glasgow and uh Los Angeles, and uh, that just wasn't working at all, so that kind of fell apart. So it was good to see a project through to the end then? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this was a lot more straightforward than that. <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, the, the lockdown has offered creative opportunities to people, and mm-hmm. I've always been surprised by how many people did not take it up, and mm-hmm. how many people did and, and found creative solutions. And I've seen some really amazing ones. But yes, there are limitations to Zoom. Yeah. yeah. I think I think um, a lot of creators, particularly writers, thought, oh, this is amazing. I can now write to my heart's content because I don't have to go anywhere and do anything. But there was a, I think there was no rhyme or reason to the people that found it very creative and the people who found the absolute opposite, you know. Um, because people, I don't know, I think it was just the how surreal it all was. So it is lovely to see something like this come together. And what about you, Scott? How how was it for you? Did you feel? Um, well, I'm not an actor or anything like that. I'm Philip's fiance. So um she asked me if I wanted to try it out and I thought, I why not? But I've I've got no I don't know if you can tell, but I've got no acting training or any experience in it. So no, no, was, no. Ah, it was fun. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, Scott, yeah. that, that, that was actually, that, that made sense to me when you were saying about the fiancé thing, because mm-hmm. um, whereas Philippa had loads and loads of lines and it was all coming thick and fast, the emotions, you just did these wee bits you would talk in. <laughs> At which which is realistic for a man in this situation. You can either, <laughs> you can either drop a little bit of oil on troubled water or you can drop a bomb, depending on... But but yeah, but the dynamic was good. The little looks you were given for the couch, it was totally like the, the partner thing. That was... I, th- I think that really did help. You're saying not an actor, but the relationship between uh-huh. you, what do you were... Uh-huh. <laughs> and I feel, I feel Scott will be going... Uh, what the next time Philippa goes, I've got a wee question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm my phone. <laughs> I, I, think you I might not be able to find him. <laughs> Where are you? I think you did really well, Scott, and, and you did say that you had some, you have had performing experience before, uh, so that always helps for nervousness now. But I think you did really well. Indeed. You took well, it really well. It was excellent. Yeah. Indeed. Well, I think that that was the main thing, Jacqueline, because you you were really helpful. The directing, so you made it really easy for me just to Excellent. follow kind of instruction <laughs> more than anything. A bit like being a filler, but no, Sean, you're right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, not being technical, I'm not sure if we've got questions from audience. I don't think we do, but could we ask Alison how she found it? Yeah, mm, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah. um, it would have been lovely to have been all in the same room um, where a dilemma was very easily not easily but you know it's more Easier. straightforward Speech. yeah um, on um, a screen it would have been lovely <clears throat> to have had the actual interaction um however um i i think it went really well it was it was good fun to do i agree wholeheartedly with philippa at the first kind of reading you think oh it's a nice light little frothy kind of you know isn't birth fun um, and then you actually start to go through it and you're like, mm, no, there's there's yeah, something there's, there's a bit of real kind of emotion in there and that and that was really nice. And um I think Phil uh, showed how well she could just fling her legs all over the place. <laughs> well <Wow. laughs> <laughs> oh, <not> smiling. <laughs> um there is a question from Anne and Anne, um, I'm going to say hi. Um, and she's asking, is this based, hang on, it's going off now, uh, is this based on real life experience, Kerry? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice, I like it. <laughs> yes. Oh, now I want to see the extended script. Is it an 18 hour script or... <laughs> Yes, this uh, is time for you to give an advert, Kerry, for your book. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, it was, and um, but then adapted, I think, and um, but I, I did feel um, it's something people don't talk about much. That feeling of being alone, and um, I do remember looking at my my daughter and not feeling anything. And then, that's not talked about. You're right. Yeah. That stuff's not. Everybody's meant to just yeah. go. Off so she could, it. It's actually from the beginning of a um, a novel I wrote, and uh, Cheryl actually it takes her quite a while to bond. But it's, uh -huh. it is meant to be funny because she has this horrendous relationship with her mother and stuff. Uh. Um, but uh, I kind of like I like to mix the two together. I think because then. The humour works so much better. Yeah, well, yeah. We were talking about that with our script because, and and I know when I write, it, um, irony is always under the humour, and humour is always under the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's your life, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. a thin line. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I now want to read the book, so yeah, you'll have to you'll have to give us details of that on script stage on the <laughs> Facebook page, and then we can all run and get it. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to know. I want yes, to know. Yes, <laughs> so Anna, Anna's asking, sorry, a follow-up question saying, how does it see, feel, Kerry, to see something, someone perform something from your own life? I think it's fantastic, actually, because um, as everybody does it, um, it's like they do it in a way that I see it differently again. Mm -hmm. And everybody adds something to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not actually, I'm not seeing me at all, but I'm just seeing how people, other people interpret it. And um, like you guys said, every time I watched it, I will see other things that were funny and all your little asides and looking and all the little yeah. actions, yeah. it really brought it to life. I really loved your feet as well. Yeah. <laughs> it sucks. You know. I just thought it was brilliant, actually, because when you write it, you have this picture in your head mm -hmm. and you kind of see it, but I, it's sort of like it, it, it expands it when other people become part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what writing's all about, really. It's, it's as much the, the reader, the, the people who watch it and, um, you know, like in a play, the actors, it, they, they kind of, they're, they're just as in, how can I put it? It sort of makes it whole, three dimensional. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, we've we've often talked about that because um, I was on a, a a writers forum in LinkedIn, and it was just saturated with people who would decry the fact that actors and directors would dare to bring something different to it. And uh, you know, I I remember going, Do you know what, away and write a book, you know? <laughs> because you don't want to see somebody. 
you don't mm-hmm. they didn't want to see a different aspect to it. So it's really lovely to hear you who's coming from a novelist point of view and enjoyed letting go and seeing what they could bring yeah. to an awful lot. Can't do it. They can't do it, you know. But um, I think it's like it's real, I think real uh, art or real life it reflects real life because we all see things differently exactly so so I think it's a compliment if everybody sees what you write slightly differently it means you're not you're not um you're you're telling the story but you're not uh what's what I'm looking for you're actually just describing it and then people are seeing it their way that's why, I'm, and it makes it a narrow, bigger story. Just, it's not just one narrow point of view. Yeah. Absolutely. It becomes mm-hmm. that, that collaboration. And it is even the collaboration of a reader or a viewer because yeah. you know, when you read a book, you, you cast it in your mind. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so you have that. But but it is, it's all about the collaboration. It's all about the, the different points of view and, mm-hmm. and the bits of... Um, well, that line doesn't work for me or for, mm-hmm. for Jacqueline as a director. <laughs> yeah. So you have to have that. And it, mm-hmm. it is very difficult, I think, um, to, to let go and to, you know, to let your babies out in the world yes. and, uh, and, and see what happens with them. Mm-hmm. But, I, think, I think that's why something like Skip to Stage is so important. And, you know, if we can... If we can, you know, expand that and and support people to write, support ourselves to write. I've always instinctively turned to actor friends to hear the word out loud, and I I can't imagine going through that process without being able to do that. And there's so many people out there, you know, who say, "Oh, I've always wanted to try that." Um, and it's and you know, I think it's important to talk about well, what do, what do people need to flourish um, to do that? You know. Um, I think too with um, with novels, yes, you can't control what your audience is as said, what your audience think, but you kind of move from that, and all you've got maybe is an editor in between. But yeah. with theatre, it really brings it home to a writer that mm. is collaborative, mm. and yeah. you, you have to relinquish some control because there's other people yeah. doing things with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's you... important to do that. The collaboration aspect is so important. Mm-hmm. I think it's really good because you you're stuck in the story. Um, and you know what's going on, but like when you, when Jacqueline kind of looked at it, she just made it work so much better because you know it's fresh eyes, mm-hmm. knowing what I think it's, it just improves your writing so much more. I think it's also what works from the page. To yeah, somebody's imagination is a bit different to what the rhythm mm. of what's needed in this. Uh, if you want to call it a presentation. Um, mm-hmm. And Helen, please feel free to come in, um, also the other actors. Um, I was interested actually to ask Tony, so she's as a complete viewer to all of that process. <laughs> I think that the thing for, yeah, I mean, I, you, I, I realise actually that, and I was going to ask this, even outside of COVID times, actors do table reads, mm-hmm. don't they? Mm-hmm. So I was wondering about, in, in under normal circumstances, this is kind of like a table read, but why is that? Presumably there's a point at which you're actually familiarizing yourself and getting used to it. It's kind of like a, a pianist or a violinist or a, it's what musicians do. We practice. It's the point at which we're interpreting and we're acquainting ourselves with the score and the notes on the page. So I suppose it is a table read like that in, in a sense. I think you always does, do yeah. something like this, a table read before you before you make it physical and before you start yeah. moving around with each other? Is that more? I, and I mean, no, quite, quite early on in the process, I want to hear it out loud before I even, um, yeah, before I'm at the finish, finished edit, as I would see it. Um, because you hear stuff and you instantly go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. Oh, no, 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 no. Or somebody else saying, no, but that's what, that's what that told me to say. And I think you learn so much about your own script. And I think the earlier you can do it, the better. I think personally, I don't know about anybody else. Are are there a lot of changes sometimes? I mean, do you ever, do you make extensive changes based on what actors tell you? Because that's another thing as well. I mean, 
we were we had our own version of this this week because um the Maxwell String Quartet were doing Alan's piece and he was asking them about okay what type of bowing this should be and they would say well actually we think it should be portato or we think it should be staccato or we think it should be pizzicato or you know like they were having a dialogue about it and he actually changed a couple of things based on their feedback as the performers so how much do writers change after this process that's that's, I suppose, my, my question. But your first point there, how much does a director change or uh, in collaboration with the writer from the, the actors speaking the words? And often the first thing that you notice is if there's missing commas, for instance, or something that's quite awkward to say, yeah. uh, if it can be improved, the, the, the actor will, will show that by just to trying to read it because they maybe stumble at a point and say, well, maybe we could word this and get a different way. Or there might be a pause that they put in and you go, oh, there's not actually a pause there. So that kind of collaboration happens as well. But then I think further on, the actors uh, depend on the process you, you adopt. The actors might talk about the character more, what they feel about the character, and that can come back and inform both the director and sometimes go back to the writer as well. It just depends. So it's always that process going on. And we cut out a full scene, didn't we, Kerry? Um, that was a, that would have been quite interesting because it was all about this couple that were having the kinky sex, um, <laughs> but it just didn't fit oh, up to that drama, you know. Maybe another time, you know. <laughs> we'll do that next time. Yeah. You also get that bit sometimes um, where you know, in a longer script, where you'll go, mm, "No, my character wouldn't say that. That's not, you know." Be, and and I've had like you know conversations with the writer and they've gone but but yeah and and you get no you know and because you you get a feeling for how your character actually is and I've I've seen me as the writer realize that actually I put words into somebody else's mouth and they, they should have been elsewhere because that character and you you don't see that until you're hearing it and until you're you're starting to go through the process both as a writer and as an actor but you have to get to to know your character and uh, and once you do then you can start to say mm, no that's not that doesn't feel right but also when you're reading yeah, no. sometimes you read something that's not there and that's simply because that's an, a more natural way of speaking which isn't maybe a natural way of writing. Because there was a piece, and I think Sean and Helen, um, there was a bit where, um, so the character Andy was relaying a, a transcript, basically, of a message he had received. And we, you know, I kind of felt, it sounds like a written piece, not a spoken piece. Mm -hmm. So I asked Helen permission um, for Sean to make that, more transcript sounding, more like spoken. He had written what somebody had said, if that makes sense. And yeah. it was somebody in a panic, whereas it, it originally it, it read like a piece of writing, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it was a transcript of, of you know, speech. So I think that's something as a writer, um, you have to, you know, when you hear it out loud, is it true voice? Is it strong voice? Is each character strong? Um, and like like Alison said, when you hear actors deliver that back, it tells you right away, oh, wait a minute, that's not strong enough. Or, so, yeah. Really Go back to character for a second. Sorry, Karen. Um, I think uh, Karen and I probably disagree over this, and that's absolutely fine. But in my actor training, we, we were taught a method that said there is no such thing as character. The char but the character is created in the audience's head. So it's when the actor says the words and does the actions, then the audience create their character in the same way that you do in the novel in some ways. And it sounds like an odd thing to say, because obviously there is character as well, and you can talk about character, but it's getting that kind of tension. And I, fi I find it works for me that way sometimes when I'm, when I'm acting myself, yeah. No, on, no, on that, I would say we agree, because I think you've got to leave, um, you create the, the 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 bubble or whatever and and also how people pick it up will differ mm -hmm. because yes. you present somebody it's not for us to decide if they'll like or dislike them some people will like one character and dislike another do you know what i mean and i think if it's too prescribed then you, you cut yeah. that out 
yeah, I'm, I'm not at all in favour of the school that kind of tries to create a character through business and or oh, they, they would do this and they'd have this sort of gesture. Oh, no. Just be yourself as no. an actor, as the person yeah. and say the lines, basically. And obviously, yeah. yeah. And the biggest thing we always get when I was doing training was, you're acting, stop it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's where you were meaning me disagree because there's sometimes <laughs> I will add in a bit of body language, but only when I want to, to use that instead of speaking, because we don't always speak what we what we want to say, do we? <laughs> you know, there's the eyes and there's... Um, but yeah, I think lots have to be left to the actor um, and the director. And I find it quite exciting to watch things come to life. Yes. Really definitely. exciting. Yeah, the phrase that comes to my mind, Karen, is a kind of collaborative synergy. It ends up being much more than it originally was because of all the collaboration and the experience. That's right. mm -hmm. that's, and you've got to trust it, haven't you? You've got to trust yeah. the other people. Very much so, yeah. yeah. I mean, we talk about Jester. I don't think you do. I think what we disagree with Karen is, is scripting the body language, but that's a different matter. But I loved, there was a bit where Scott, I can't remember, it was a, let's not talk about the perineum. And his eyes just went up and he wasn't asked to do that anything, but he just did it naturally. No, no. And it really, really uh -huh. worked. Yeah. Yeah. It's not an easy word to say, perineum. I'm sorry? <laughs> it's not an easy word to say, perineum. perineum. Especially well, when you swear in the middle. I was very really really impressed, Philippa. Yeah. <laughs> my, my comedy character is Letitia Perino, which is based on Perineum. <laughs> Good name. I have to, I wanted to add some, I wanted to, well, I wanted to ask something because it occurred to me the acting is, is so... It's so fantastic. I, I'm not, I don't want to single anyone out, but I, I happened to, um, I was running in and out because I had the other event, but I was, um, Sean Moore strikes me as having the most incredible presence and just every everything you do somehow, you just pull me in, no matter what it is. And I'm wondering like how you get to that point where it just, it just strikes me as you're not even trying. It's just, it's just, you know, I mean, and I've, I've not had you, I've not really heard you do um, your spoken word live, um, which I will have the pleasure of this week along with everyone else. But I, I was just wondering, like, how do you get to that point? Well, first of all, thanks. That's why that, that was, that was, that was lovely. A, a compliment. And for someone who's spent so much time in her life and surrounded by performers and professionals and things, ah, do you know what? Can, this might sound really, really corny and stuff, but I just come to this kind of fun um, pastime late on in life. Like, uh, played sport, worked my arse off in my younger days, and now I've got a bit, a bit of time, and, and, and I've and I've been lucky to meet um, people that are involved in, in a broad spectrum of arts, and I'm. It's just like. Christmas for me. I've, 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 I've suddenly been allowed to do all these things, and I think it's enjoyment. Um, it's, I'm, I'm, I do things with the enthusiasm of a puppy, um, when I really should be a cynical old hard bit and middle aged man, and, and I don't feel like that. And I don't know, maybe that's what's shining through when I'm, when I'm doing something, um, be it joining in with a band or singing in a chorus with something. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can tell. You can well, I, tell. Wish, I wish it was a more scientific explanation or I could tell you about some positive thinking course that I've done. <laughs> no, sorry. Does anyone else from the cast want to? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> acting is just, I'm just so overwhelmed. I did not mean to single Sean out. It, it was just because I'm so, I'm so impressed. And, and mostly because I've not really worked that much with actors. I think I've, I've probably worked more with other creative artists. I've worked with dance makers and, you know, uh, visual artists and artists working with um, media and, and digital media and things like that. But I've, <laughs> I'm just so amazed. You just, you, you, I mean, it's it's your lived experience. Um, I've got one thing I wanted to ask. Have you ever played a character that you hated? That you couldn't find any sort of redeeming quality? I did get asked to do that and I auditioned for it. 
sorry, to, um, that I felt was a, was a horrible character, a really nasty person in a, in a very unlikable way, but there was no redeeming factor in the script. And for me, there always has to be a redeeming factor because no humans are totally evil. Mm -hmm. So I turned it down. But yeah, I played really bad characters. I played people who smash people's head against walls and uh, all the rest of it, and it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I once played Cinderella and hated it because <laughs> because she was so sweet. And I, I can't lie, I I'm comfier as the drunk or the whore, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, definitely. These are, these are more interesting parts to yeah. play in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you do have to find some point of, of uh, empathy or understanding with the character, or, or you just can't play it. It you becomes a cartoon if you if you can't add some extra dimension to it. And if that isn't there in the script, then you yeah you kind of have to dig deep and try and find something yeah, so that that doesn't go against the script, but adds to it and uh, gives a, a a different level of reality to what it has on the page. Yeah, definitely. Okay, is that us? Then I think all that remains is to say thank you. Thank you to the Tannehill um, Festival for having us. Thank you to Hopscotch for streaming us. Thank you to all the actors and the directors. And in particular, thank you to the writers for giving us your words. Yes, okay. indeed. Script to stage will return, but I don't know when, and I don't know where, and I don't know how. So it's a mystery, but I'm can sure I, we will. Can right. I just put a wee plug in for Tuesday? Um, so uh, I've got a one act play that's been performed in the bungalow on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Uh, doors open at seven, and uh, the play begins um, at half past seven. Um, we're calling it a play, a, 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 a play, a put in a pint. So you'll get the play, you'll get a wee drink, and you'll get a creamy cake or something as well. Oh, cool. And also, on top of that, we'll also do a bit of chat afterwards, um, mostly around, you'll get a Q&A with the actors and myself, but also around what new writers need from the Renfrewshire area, shall we say, to uh, to, uh, to flourish. So Has anyone fun. else, sorry, Karen, sorry. Okay. anyone else got a, a wee plug that would like to put in at the moment? Can I, I'll let Alan do it. Oh, right. God, now I have to remember it. Uh, <laughs> our, our big, by far, our biggest event is the Paisley Abbey Thursday. So there's a classical recital Tony will be playing with a soprano. Then we have Evelyn Laurie. Some might know Evelyn Laurie. She's uh, from six till seven, and then from eight o'clock, um, prize winning uh, jazz duo Luca Manning and Fergus McCready. So that's the, the, the big one to push. So hopefully see you there. If I don't see you before, I'm obviously going to uh, Karen's play and looking forward to it. Just say the, our digital stage manager has said, thank you everyone. If they turn off your cameras at the end, you'll leave the title running for a minute or two and then turn off the stream. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, Bravo, everybody. see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, writers. Bye. Ellen, Kerry, thank you, Jacqueline, for Bye. your stressing and organising. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs>